I should probably we should do the um, the bios of each person so we know what we're talking about. So Scott, get the right thing. S Scott Hamilton Kennedy. Its first film was uh, second film was The Garden. It was nominated for an Academy Award in 2008. His most recent film is Food Evolution, narrated by Neil deGrasse Tyson, which explores the the polarized debate around GMOs. And it just had its world premiere Saturday at the festival. I don't know if any, did anybody see it in the audience, by the way? Um, this film is going to be very controversial. I think you can say that. Um, next, uh, uh, next to Scott is Christy Jacobson. Um, Christy's most recent film is Solitary, which is a daring look inside a supermax prison that premiered at Tribeca and will be on HBO, and first in theaters and then on HBO, right? Yes. Next year, right? And in 2012, she did a, a Place at the Table, which is an in-depth examination of hunger in America, which is an astonishing film I just saw. It was amazing. And it premiered at Sundance and was produced by Participant Media and distributed theatrically by Magnolia Pictures. And But she's going to be showing a clip from a work in progress, which is called Billion Oyster Project, <laughs> which will be on the Discovery Channel uh, two years from now, 2018, right? And then... Ish. Ish. <laughs> ish. <laughs> Ch and Ch next to Christy is David Abel, who's both a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter at the Boston Globe and a filmmaker. Um, his latest film is Sacred Cod, which explores overfishing and the collapse of the historic cod population in New England. And that will be broadcast next year on the Discovery Channel. And this is your, it's your third film, is that right? Right. And right. your other two films were on? The Marathon Bombings. Right. We're not on. Okay. We're not getting anything. Okay. Check, check. Check, 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 check. There we go. Okay. And our other panelist is John Hoffman. John Hoffman is the Executive Vice President of Documentaries and Specials for the Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, and Science. He has been actively involved in directing, producing, and stewarding award-winning documentary films for nearly 30 years, including 17 years at HBO. And John was the driving force behind the very successful four-part series called the Weight of the Nation four years ago and the unique campaign surrounding the series. So um, I've asked John if he would sort of co-moderate the panel since he's extremely, uh, he's probably, <laughs> you've probably worked on hundreds of documentaries over the years, right? A lot. Yeah, a lot. So he's quite an expert in, in, in producing, uh, directing, and also the outreach campaigns around documentary films. So I wanted just to give a, a quick little introduction. Uh, so today we're talking about documentary, environmental documentaries, and sort of the, 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 the pamphlet said what works, what doesn't, and how to define a successful environmental film. Documentaries play an incredibly important role in protecting the natural world. We need stories, and nonfiction films can dramatically show us what's at stake from climate change to overfishing to endangered species to local threats. Films, films can make science and data come alive, and more importantly, share the stories of communities, environmental victims, and activists in real life. And effective documentaries can touch our hearts and minds, disturb us, inspire us, and provide a centerpiece for debate, action, and change. And especially during the coming four years, more than ever, we need documentary filmmakers to continue to bravely shine the light where so many conventional journalists don't. Um, in fact, in the, in the previous panel, Kara was talking about how she, she was looking back to the Nixon era as an as analogy to what's going on now. I think a really good analogy is 1981 when Reagan became president and we had a huge movement that it was uh, the nuclear freeze campaign which I was very involved in and that we had a, a million people marching in Central Park the year after he was in office. I think we're going to see a similar kind of huge movement, a uh, grassroots movement in different dimensions, not just one dimension as the freeze was. Um, I want to say one more thing too is that many people have called this the golden age of documentaries. There are now many more channels and ways to see docs. Last year, Discovery broadcast the powerful environmental doc Chasing Extinction to a worldwide audience. And just a few weeks ago, Nat Geo showed Leonardo DiCaprio's film Before the Flood, which had attracted around 30 million people worldwide if you t take in all the different kinds of media that th where they saw it. And also, we're now broadcasting the second season, you can follow also on Nat Geo, of Years of Living Dangerously, which was on Showtime uh, a year and a half ago. So now we have Netflix and Amazon, CNN, Epics are all now programming more documentaries, and HBO continues to show exceptional films. 
At the same time, I think we're also seeing that theatrically it's very difficult to show a film. That there's a lot less audiences that are willing to pay money to go to see film in theaters. They want to see it at home or they want to see it on their mobile devices. So anyway, I want to jump to our panelists right now. And with, with the main qu question, I don't, do we want to show the clips at the beginning? Of each? Sure. Why, don't we, why don't we show the three clips? So the first clip is from David's film, Sacred Cod. Something's at three to four percent. It's it's time to worry. We really are one of the fastest warming places on the planet right now. The Gulf of Maine does not give up her secrets very easily. A lot of things to be learned in this business. Which one of the most important ones? Don't trust the government. I've hung on a, a, a belief a way of life. I just wanted to give my family a little more than what I had. Maybe you're going to fire some of your employees, just like hundreds of fishermen have been fired. There was probably 45 people who worked here. Today, we have seven. And this is what science misses on. So this really becomes a community loss. The bottoms of these breeding grounds have become virtual deserts. There's no more cod on Cape Cod. The last ice man of Gloucester. Levels are pretty high. From the wharfs, to the fish deals, to the truckers, to the supermarkets, to our churches that are friggin' empty now. It's the death of a way of life. Great. Okay, so the next clip is from Christie's upcoming film, Billion Oyster Project. Keep in mind this is a work in progress, so not yet color corrected, sound mixed. First time out of the gate. The only time I saw the New York Harbor or saw a boat was when I would take the J train over the bridge and I'd see a tugboat. Well, I'd been on the water since I was around two. My dad brought me out on the boat all the time. Every weekend we're doing something on the water. New York Harbor used to be one of the most beautiful and bioproductive places on the planet. New Yorkers ate oysters right from New York Harbor but the water quality had gotten so bad, mostly from human sewage. So people stopped eating oysters. I live exactly a mile away from the ocean in Coney Island, Brooklyn. Sandy affected everything. Me and my mom went out the next day after Sandy. The sand from the beach was covering cars on the street. If we still had the oyster reefs, that would have broke the storm surge. It would have absorbed it. Every time it rains, all the 14 wastewater treatment plants are inundated and untreated sewage and household wastewater goes right out in the harbor. That's everything from your toilet and your shower and your sink. 30 billion gallons of untreated Storm water and sanitary sewer flows into New York Harbor every year. The Billion Oyster Project grew out of the New York Harbor School. Oysters filter the water that provide habitat for other animals. They're the coral reefs of temperate seas. But the way to clean it up is for people to stop pouring sewage into the harbor. We can't afford to not engage youth in restoring and protecting the planet. Let's bring this ecosystem back. Let's get engaged in restoring the ecosystem. Let's rally around restoring New York Harbor. I don't find it to be such a far-fetched idea that New York Harbor is in the hands of a bunch of high school students. I think it makes sense, right? Because we're gonna be the ones dealing with it in the future. Wow. 
Wow, it looks terrific. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, the next clip is from Scott's uh, upcoming film, Food Evolution. Just because Christy did an intro, I have to too. <laughs> Just kidding. This is the beginning of the film. It's not. It's uh. It's it's the opening of the film. Here we go. Survival of our species has always depended on advances in food and agriculture. There are 7.3 billion people on the planet. The world's population is expected to top 9 billion in 2050. Climate change is going to scramble this whole how are we going to feed the world debate. This is all about companies controlling our future. So, amongst all this conflict and confusion, how do we make the most informed decisions about how we feed ourselves? That the, 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 the um, statistics are so disturbing, aren't they? About all the sewage that goes into New York. I have no idea. Yeah, I, d so I didn't either. What is, what is it? 30, what is it? Million? What is it? 30 billion Gallon? gallons of waste? Tons? Uh, I'm, Yorkers, still, I'm still, I'm still becoming Whatever an expert. It is, it's a huge amount. Yeah. I, I yeah. Thought, it's essentially know. what happens is every time it rains, even if it rains a small amount, right. Um, the the um, it's called combined sewage overflow, and um, the waste treatment plants can't handle what's coming in through uh, through the system plus what's happening in the streets because of the rain. So they just so it just send yesterday. it into the water. We had about an inch yesterday of rain. Then that and that was happening. Thirty million gallons of That's sewage. Right. That's, That's when right. you don't want to swim in the East River. <laughs> right. So when so when we're filming. Um, when, as we've been filming this project, the, the students at the Harbor School, uh, one group of them um, do scuba diving. And when we've been scheduling, I mean, scheduling documentaries is, is a challenge always, but scheduling a documentary that involves students swimming in New York and or diving in New York Harbor is even harder because it's not only dependent on the weather that day, but if it, they can't swim until three days after a rain, it would be unsafe. But on the flip side, oysters thrive and can filter that water right. um, no matter, you know, even at this point it's cleaner now than it was at least 30 years ago. Well, I, I thought, you know, the, the river keeper and water keeper and they really cleaned up the river a lot. I heard that, but I didn't know that it's still this insanely polluted. It's there has been progress made, but, but clearly we have more work to do. So why don't you start with, tell us why, you know, why you picked this topic to make your movie and what your thoughts are about your films. And should I toss that to you, John? Um, I have asked uh, Christy and Roger to make oh, this film um, with my team, John and Allie, who are here. Um, <clears throat> I um, now I'm blanking whether it was a radio or a. I think it was radio. Radio um, piece that I heard, mm -hmm. and uh, just the name Billion Oyster Project made my ears go, you know, and my antenna go up. And um, then digging in and, and learning about the program and thinking you just have to bring a camera there and the story will tell itself and I think that's uh, they're well on their way to This that. is an existing project, the Billion Oyster so Project. So this, is, this right? is a project that, uh, as this clip shows, uh -huh. is housed at something called the New York Harbor School, which is a public high school yeah. on Governor's Island. Um, oh. And it's not a school that kids have to test into. They can just say, I want to go to that school. Um, uh, and all New York City high school kids have to pick the high school they go to. 
So those that learned about this high school at a fair um, say, that sounds like fun, and they are coming from all five boroughs, and they take a ferry to school every day, and many of them are part of the creation. They are building right. these reefs, these kids. Right, so what, you wanna say more about, I mean, you're now you're making the film. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, th this uh, collaboration is reflective of the way I often make films. So sometimes there's films that I generate, Solitary, for example, went back to my early days studying criminal justice, and it was a film that I wanted to take from, you know, from zero all the way, all the way to completing it. Um, and then there's times where other people have fantastic ideas. Um, and uh, you know, there's always a moment of trying to. You have to see if this is if this really grabs you. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't, then it's not the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, Roger and I, Roger Ross Williams and I are co-directing the film, and Julie Goldman, our producer, is here as well. And we we went on several visits to the school, um, you know, as we were discussing. Because for me, you know, I, it's it's really hard to make a film about something someone else wants me to make or or an issue, right? Like. It has to be about the people and the story, and it's all about connecting with those people and with the story. And um, we were just talking about how, you know, about a year ago is when we started the conversations, and I knew very little about the harbor. And in the in the in the past year, I've been in places in the five boroughs of New York City that I've never been in right, before, right. that I never even knew existed, and I my whole worldview is different. And what ends up happening is. For better and for worse, I seem to only be able to make one film at a time because um, <laughs> I get so completely and totally engrossed and consumed by the people and the story um, that I'm filming. Um, so we were really fortunate that um, John had this idea uh, or had heard that radio report because it's really, it's also really nice because uh, while there are some sad and harsh facts, um, you know the hope uh, that we see and capture every day, and not just the students, but the the, the people leading this right. organization right. is really inspiring. Well, I th just think that this film, because you're going to see 15, 16 year olds saving the river, has a thrilling dimension to it that that is sort of could be accessible. Every high school kid in the country could be inspired by it. It's not exactly. just about the river, just about the oysters. It's like we can do something major. We all get together. I think it's an inc it could be an incredible, it sort of uh, uh, addresses the issue about outreach and how do you reach new audiences and how can the film become a centerpiece mm -hmm. for other action. It sounds like this film has an incredible potential. You know, yeah. when you think about what it's, the bigger story, it's amazing. Um, both the pollution's hor horrifying, but what they're doing and they're going to be doing this for years, the school, high school, right? That's right. I mean, I think that's what's kind of, it, it, right. it may seem intimidating, the number, um, a billion oysters. Um, but at the same time, like, we were filming one day, and there were 750,000 oysters going in that day, you know? <laughs> so um, it, the, the scale is large, but so, too, are the, are the s sort of soldiers. Um, they're, they're capable of a lot. Right. So you could see this film, just joining the outreach, this could be shown in every high school in the country or junior high school in the country, couldn't it? Absolutely. I mean, this could be... John? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean wh why not think as big as you can about it, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and um, I think that one of the reasons that you, know, you, we, you, you respond, I responded to a story like this, and then we go and, and, and we all agree there is something there. It's um, the reason to go forward is not only that there's going to be you know a beautiful film that comes out of it, right. but that it's everything that you're right. saying. You right. know that right. that um, we have to. We live in this amazing time when there are so many platforms um, to put content on, and that television and long form content is still, thankfully, still seen as um, sort of a a sort of centerpiece. Can be the centerpiece. Yeah. Of, of something, and that around that can be spinning all kinds of activities. Um, and so, you know, I, I do have a lot of experience with um, launching projects that have all kind, you know, many right. dimensions, right. Um, and I, I love that process. So, um, unquestionably, Billion Oyster is going to have, you know, billions of projects. It's right, clearly I mean, exciting yeah. that it has solutions as, as well. We've seen so many environmental yeah. films that have scared the crap out of us, and we needed to have the crap scared out of us. And at the same time, it's nice to see 
see solutions. I mean, Georgetown University has a has a prize that they give out for people coming up with prizes to fix these environmental issues, and they point to how many solutions have been found over the history of man that are inspired by prizes. So, congratulations on finding something that's uh, that's a solution as well. So, thanks. Now we just need to find the solution in the edit. <laughs> but, yeah, that's hard. Yeah. But I think that's, that's actually it's, it's, it's a really good point because you know the criticism of some documentaries and environmental documentaries is you want to blow your brains out after you see the movie. You know, it's like, oh my God, it's all about how horrible everything is. And this film clearly is going to be very inspiring. And, you know, um, and the great thing about showing it in a school as opposed to on a mobile device is that every screening can have a, like a town hall meeting afterwards where people can say, what can we do in our community? Maybe you don't have oysters in a river, but we have you know, other things that we can do. So I'm a big fan of, of you know, in-person screenings where there's always a discussion afterwards led by students, right. you know, some teachers, but mostly students, you know, so that kind of thing. And I think that speaks also to the, the, the I think, the unique value of film um, to sort of take the, you know, it's, it's both local and personal, this right. film, yeah. but it's, it's, it speaks universally, and I think that that's one of the values of, of, of many of the, the films that we're right. probably here discussing. And right. I would think you could, you could sort of parlay this into other cities. I mean, Boston has had the same problems, and we've spent billions of dollars, and partly what got George, w, George Bush the first elected based on the problems that Mike Dukakis had in 1988 with Boston Harbor, and you have this problem in every major city mm -hmm. on the water. But David, why and you, you have talk students. To that need to be engaged uh, meaningfully in every city. I was going to say, David, you want to talk about your film too, because this also has missense solutions at the end, and it's also about it's related to somewhere somewhat to the other film. So yeah, um, our film is a film that gives a, a a sense of what's happened to what is America's what has been America's oldest fishery, and it's uh, cod are what brought settlers to the United States. It's what financed the American Revolution. It's what sustained uh, fishermen and communities all along the Eastern Seaboard uh, for generations. And uh, two years ago, the federal government imposed a moratorium on fishing cod in uh, the waters off New England. And that has caused great distress for the communities uh, that have lived off cod for generations. And we look at the impact of overfishing. We look at the impact of climate change on what has uh, caused the challenges of the fishery to rebound. And we also look at solutions as to what, uh, what can happen uh, without such a staple, uh, such a big part of our cultural heritage and our industry in our region, and how can these communities rebound. And it's very personal because you really talk to a lot of the fishermen. Some were very upset by the, the restrictions. Absolutely. Some, so yeah. it, it, it's a film that's really told through the eyes of, uh, of not just fishermen, but all kinds of people right. who have deep roots in the community, businesses that are suffering, uh, like ice houses that provide the ice to the fishermen. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole cadre of environmental advocates uh, and, and scientists who have been vested in trying to find solutions. And we look at the, at, at the plight of cod through their eyes as well. Right, and, and also there's, there's controversy about, about the, the ban and people angry at the government. You almost see the, the election being played out in the, in the voices of the, the community in some ways. In a lot of ways, I think it's, it's reflective of a lot of the issues that uh, we are confronting, whether it's climate change or uh, bigger issues that you see on the, national, on the national stage, should we believe the science? Right. Is the okay. government trying to screw us? Um, they don't understand what we're seeing, according to the fishermen, uh, who right. uh, fish in certain waters where cod have aggregated and remain uh, abundant, um, but it doesn't look at the bigger picture necessarily, and it misses out on a lot of things, and, and it depends on your vantage point and your perspective, and, and I think it emphasizes the need for, um, 
for seeing the broader picture, but also understanding the microcosm of suffering that exists uh, throughout uh, different parts of the community. Right, and you, and you really let the people in the film speak their minds, share their stories. I think it makes it very personal, so I think that's actually very important. I, I would love to underline those two words you just used, it depends. It's, I think those words are, are left out sometimes when we get into black and white issues in environmental filmmaking. I don't know if anybody knows who Jason Clay is from the World Wildlife Fund. He has a wonderful TED Talk that you look at, and he uses those two words to really break down that it's very, very complicated to look at any of these issues. It's not, oh, the fishermen are wrong, or the government is evil, and the fishermen are wrong. Excuse me, I haven't seen your film. Or that, you know, is it, it which is more sustainable, a lamb chop that was locally grown and brought to your plate from 50 feet, or a lamb chop that was fr flash frozen and brought from Australia? And it, it, it depends, and we leave that out of the conversation sometimes. So just wanted to underline those two words. Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about your film and oh, the passion. Me, excuse me. But the passion behind, you, why did you pick this issue? Sure. What, you know, what do you think is, is going to happen with your film? So Food Evolution started um, when an organization, a science organization called IFT, the Institute of Food Technologists. Does anybody know what f a food scientist is? Anyone? Food scientist? Trace, I see you back there. Uh, the most famous food scientist in uh, film history was Chevy Chase in, bake in, in, in National Lampoon's Vacation, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, so food science starts at the farm gate and then goes all the way to our tables, and I won't get all those, those, those pieces. And they, were, they interviewed a, a variety of filmmakers to say, we want to make a film dealing with food and science and looking at the huge issues of our population going up to nine, nine and a half billion by 2050. By some people's regard, we need to make more food in the next 36 years than we have in the past 10,000. So huge, huge issues. And when I teach documentaries, if some a young filmmaker comes and says to me, I want to make a movie about the environment, I'm like, okay. <laughs> bring it in. <laughs> so this was the, I'd, I'd never been faced with having to bring an idea in. Um, my producing and writing partner, Trey Sheehan, is in the audience, and we went away and researched and researched. So they approached you about making a movie. That's right, and they, but they said, I, and I said, well, first of all, I was so cynical, this is where we live uh, in this world, that when I first heard about them, I, even the name sounds like IFT, the Institute of Food Technologists, I respected that they were scientists, but I was like, are they talking to me because I made an environmental film and they just want to see where I stand, but then they're going to go make an <laughs> industrial or something? <laughs> I was totally paranoid, and they were completely open, and I said, you know, I can't do any of this if I don't have Final Cut. Right. And they said, absolutely, you have to have Final Cut. As scientists, they understood that you can't, you know, it doesn't matter who funds the science, I know it's going to sound scary to a lot of you, who funds the science as long as they're independent, that they're not asking for results from the beginning. So I said, if we don't have Final Cut, we can't go forward. And they said, absolutely. And Trace and I went away and researched and researched and researched. And the GMO story was just waving its hands as being a timely story, a controversial story, a story where the science was not being told, was not being listened to. Mm -hmm. uh, we found through Amy Harmon, a wonderful writer for the New York Times, uh, introduced us to the issues in Hawaii where they were the, gonna be the first state to ban GMOs. And there was uh, some of the people on the council that stood up and said, I'm sorry, but science doesn't support what you're saying. And there was this big controversy. It was the first article to open our eyes to, many of us, our eyes to the fact that GE technology saved the papaya industry in, uh, in Hawaii. GE is gene genetic, genetic engineering. engineering. Sorry, so GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Right. The correct, the scientific term is genetically engineered. Right. And that was one of the things that we needed to get across in the film is what is it, right? We've all gotten Facebook posts saying GMOs are evil and Monsanto is evil, and then right. we have to get down to what is it exactly? And it's a breeding method, right? So that was really one of our, our goals in the film was can we tell a film that explains that this is a breeding method that shows all the ways that it can be used, that does not give a hall pass to Monsanto or other people that are led by greed. And you'll see in the film, there's some other people that are outed for making mistakes based on greed. Um, and you know, can we make a controversial film that in the end makes the conversation better? And I know we're all making comparisons to what happened last Tuesday, but we were, we're living in a, we were living in a bubble too. You know? mm -hmm. Bill Maher liked to make a, used to do a bit about, oh look, the Republicans are in that bubble. And we were in the bubble, too. We were in our own bubble of not realizing how we were communicating with people or insulting people was a term we use in the film is the science of science communication is you can have the data right, but if you come up to somebody and go, I have the data right, you're an idiot. That's a fail. 
That's a terrible way of communicating with somebody. So it's a, it's a complicated film, and we're very excited about getting it out Right, there. so part of it is how do you make the science come alive, right? Sure. So because okay. science can be very dry. So how yeah, did you do, how did you tell us how you thought about that with your film? Because you, you did interview a lot of people who were involved, a lot of farmers. Sure. We were there when the city council in Hawaii was debating the GMO issue. Sure. Um, we, well, all, 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 all of us as filmmakers clearly love to use the characters lead first. This was the, this was the broadest film I've ever made where it takes place all over the globe and it right. was an issue based, but of course we found amazing characters and scientists. There's a wonderful couple from UC Davis who uh, the wife is, is, a bio, is a bioengineer and the husband right. is an organic farmer. And you think like, oh my God, how could they be <laughs> married? So what do they talk about at dinner? Um, and it's it, the reasons that they uh, love each other and the reasons that it works is the fact that they are about making sustainable agriculture. It's not one side is better. Right. You, could, you could make a GE seed and, and then grow it using uh, organic farming methods. So but getting back to making the science engaging, we found an amazing graphics house. I, I'm sure all of us have worked with incredible people, the, the glossary out of uh, Los Angeles. And we worked very, very carefully uh, with them on what the look was going to be, what the feel was going to be. I don't know if other filmmakers have struggled with this. We're, you know, we're very proud of the production value of the film, but we've seen films that you know, were shot on an iPhone, and then they have like million dollar graphics, and it just takes you out of the movie. It's like, wow, that was really slick, but it, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. So we worked very hard to make it to have the scientific gravitas that we wanted to have in the film and be engaging and clear, right? We wanted it to be very, very clear. Um, so yeah, the glossary was a fantastic and also the, part the, the, the Is it called? The glossary? The glossary, yeah. But also you, you needed the science to be very precise. Of course. Because a film yeah. like yours is going to be extremely controversial. And as we've seen is that if there are any, if the science is, is, is not very clear or your statistics are a little bit vague. Yeah, if we're squishy, you now can, you're it dead. It can be very, um, there could be war going on. Well, I'd, I'm glad you brought that up for this panel in particular. If there's something I'd love to say to all of us is if we're making films that have to do with the environment, making films that have to anything to do with data, be bulletproof, right? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I asked some of the activists in the film were on both sides of the conversation, but especially activists, which is more important to, to get your message across and get your point across or to tell the whole nuanced truth. Right. And we killed ourselves to try and make it as engaging as possible, but we need to tell the whole nuanced truth and not go lockstep towards some of our friends, that friends' ideology or some ideology that we've come to love as well. And I think that's, there's, you know, I, we're so honored to have Neil deGrasse Tyson come on as our narrator. Mm -hmm. And because it's not a pro-GMO film, it's a pro-science film. And if we don't use data, we end up in situations like what happened last Tuesday, where make people are making decisions based on emotions and not on facts. But also, th 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 it's the data and the science, but also the importance of finding the people to tell the story. It's very important. Sure. And so on maybe this everything. Maybe both you guys could, could comment on that. On casting, sure. Yeah. You want me to go? No, um, Yeah, I mean, I think that, I you know, it, it all boils down to the audience connecting with the people they see on screen, which then further boils down to the filmmakers and the people being filmed connecting. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, when we set out to make this film, um, we had like, you know, this vast pool of, of students and um, what, do you, what do you do around that? And, and my previous film was called Solitary. It took place inside of a supermax that had hundreds of prisoners. Um, and, and while some filmmakers uh, might approach this with some kind of scientific chart, not to um, diss science, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, uh, you know, let's casting talk to, is, let's it, talk casting to. Casting is instinctual. It's in just ways. instinct. It's just right. about let's get in there, let's see how this school works, let's see how this organization operates, and let's try and, like, and, and thankfully we have you know, uh, 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 an executive and um, uh, a network that is willing to let us find the story because otherwise I feel like, you know, I've been in situations where you have to cram, where you have to cram and, and, and it never works. Mm -hmm. um, so we just, and also, you know, when people sort of see a filmmaking team, they see the camera, the, 
the boom and they're like, oh right, we need to perform, right? Like that's like people's right, instinct okay. at first. And so you need to just like be relentless in your presence. That sometimes means capturing stuff that may or may not you know, be in the film, but is essential to putting you in the position to capture things with people um, because they just start to go like, these people are not going away. Um, and so we're just gonna break down and and like kind of, we I can't be I can't be on all the time and they're not going away. So did you um, get to audition them? Audition that sounds funny in the uh -huh. document, but did you get to talk to them before? Skype has been so brilliant in terms of casting. For well, us we now. luckily our location is Governor's Island, so we had the good fortune of like taking a ferry um, over to the island and going. This is like my shoot in New York City today. It's <laughs> totally beautiful. Um, so, so yeah. I mean, so, so for me, and I think what Scott's saying, and I, and I don't know you as well, David, but um, it's, it's really about you know, there, it, there's this magic. There might be some kind of um, uh, equation. I don't. I wouldn't know how to quantify it. You know, well, it's similar to even a scripted film. People forget about that with a documentary. Is you do want to have. That's what I was saying about casting. You do want to see can they communicate? Right. right? Are right. they are they going to be stiff? Are they going right. to are they going to lock up? Right. And is there variety? Right. Where you have right. the smart person, you know, the funny person, you know, the right. person that might be a little bit of a loose cannon. Right. You know, bring some 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 humor to it. Did you have any students? Because I've shot with so many students. Did you have any students that were like, oh, you're not you're not talking to me anymore. <laughs> uh, first of all, everyone should know that Scott made the most extraordinary film called OTR Town, which was about high school students putting on that play. So um, he's got the most experience in this in this field. But yeah, no, we we're still filming. Um, so <laughs> we we have made it clear for sure that they're you know they're they're just we're just capturing a lot of material, and we're fortunate that these kids um, have allowed us to do that, and they've 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 just kind of like brought us on their journey. Um, so yeah, but it is also, you know, I think a lot of what a, the, the edit also becomes really important right. because then you realize, well, we have a ton of great material, hopefully. <laughs> um, we have a lot of possibilities, um, but in the end we're building a, you know, we have to build a narrative arc and different people will play different roles. Um, and so our editor, one of our editors, Jean Chen, is here. So that's a, that's a really you know, critical. What are you doing here? Get back to work. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so, so David, for your film, too, what critical about part of characters? It. Yeah, I was going to say one of the unique challenges that we had with Sacred Cod was that we had these really authentic and passionate um, fishermen who are really uh, wonderful advocates for their point of view and their cause. And then when you would try to get the scientists to uh, convey the, their point of view or the scientific uh, findings in a similarly vivid, compelling way, <laughs> it, it, would, it would often get sort of like, well, there's this and that, and there's so much gray, and we, you know, struggled a little bit, as John knows, to find effective spokesmen for the scientific point of view. Right. And, um, and I think that's a challenge when you're making these kinds of films that, that you could find a sort of imbalance when you're talking to the people that they have the vested interest and their heart is so deeply entwined in their cause, which in this case, in our, in our film is, is the plight of the fishermen, but there is an equally compelling and and passionate point of view in what has caused all of these fish to disappear and why in certain cases the fishermen, while their perspective might be valid, it's also missing the bigger picture. And so we struggled. There, there was this one person in the film in our film that appears toward the end of the film, which in my mind sort of you know, there's a, a lot of back and forth between the fishermen and the scientists. And there was this one particular scientist who oversees the assessment of the cod fishery. He's sort of the, the guy who says really what is out there and what, um, what you know, the, essentially provides the numbers for the fish in the sea. And he wouldn't talk to us for months. Mm. And I was pleading with him mm -hmm. and explaining to him, look, you know, we, we have a sort of imbalanced portrait here, and you will talk to me off the record or for print uh, from my newspaper, 
but you got to go on camera. You got to you got to make this case. And finally, he did, and that I think really brought the brought that side of the story home. All right, so you got to be very persuasive. Okay. Did you get to have scientists and farmers in the same frame, right, in the same scenes and things like that? Yes, so yes. Scientists and fishermen. Sorry, I jumped to my own movie. <laughs> yeah, farmers, I, forgive me. We we had that that exact problem. So the film has it's sort of one of the culminating uh, elements of our film is this is this forum that the f between the scientists, administrators from NOAA who sort of have to balance the commercial interest and the, s and the environmental uh, interest, and the fishermen. Right. And there was, if you see toward the end of the film, this great back and forth uh, about, you know, you guys are lying and you're, you're trying to put us out of business. And it sort of ends the scene on the guy in the middle, the administrator from NOAA, um, the, the chief bureaucrat over, over fishing issues in New England said, well, I hear, I hear from the fishermen this, and I hear from the scientists. Well, who the hell is right? Mm. And we needed the answer to that in I at least a compelling we answer. He needed the answer. <laughs> <laughs> he Someone needed the was answer. demanding but the no, answer to that. I, I, was, I, I wanted the answer. It, 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 there's more complexity uh, to this. Did to farm this fishing? Did how farm? We, how we were trying to get. But actually, in the sort of in the minutia of this, a anytime you make a film, I made this film with two other people, and there are, um, you know, personal dynamics that sure. somewhat have to be overcome to get at least my vision for what I wanted the film to be. Right. And in that case, it was really helpful when John and his team came in and helped us sort of, you know, it, it helped me sort of frame the argument to one of my partners that w we really needed this. And, um, and that really ultimately allowed us to sort of get through a lot of the uh, bullshit to, right. you know, give a clear explanation. John, John, why don't you jump in about this, about the, well, the getting the science right and also right. the personalities and the, I mean, the, the, the stories. Well, you know, I, I've been, in listening um, to each filmmaker talk about, you know, the, the challenges of making their film, uh, what I find myself thinking about is the word evidence. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and in putting that in the greater context of, you know, the past couple of weeks and the election, um, I, I think that, you know, how we think about evidence and, and in this, uh, in this vein, you know, scientific evidence and how it's used and how, um, what is what is our role as a, you know, as an entertainment company, as a content platform, what is my role um, in trying to shape the content that goes out, not only, you know, to this country, but to the world, right. um, because our platform is so big. Um, and I'm, I'm, that's what my mind is thinking about, is this, this notion of, of evidence. Um, and I have spent a, the majority of my you know, career, um, both as an executive and as a filmmaker, working in science um, and um, believing in the scientific method mm -hmm. um, and believing in evidence um, and believing that we can't have progress unless we um, trust in that process and the weighing of data, um, and um, at some points having to use judgment um, at the end of the day to affect either a policy, um, a funding stream. You know, there's there are a, there is a there is a you know a subjective quality to it that can't be denied. But the notion of evidence, at least I still to this day, and we will see what happens over the next, you know, in, in this administration. Um, but right now, I still have to trust in the public's belief in, you know, the validity of scientific evidence. Um, so I have to use that in guiding me in deciding that there is enough evidence to make a film. Um, there's enough, mm. that a film is not presenting enough evidence mm. 
to make its case convincingly. So that the audience who has come and said, okay, I'm going to make this decision, I'm gonna sit and watch this film, I'm gonna gather my family, whatever, and we're gonna watch this, that they are, there is a sort of compact between that viewer and the broadcaster that we have done our work mm -hmm. and we have, you know, we have acted responsibly and that's what they have some expectation, you know, um, from discovery and, and what, you know, what we mean in the culture. Um, so there's a lot of responsibility to live up to that. Right. Um, so I have to, in turn, you know, I have to turn to the creative community and say, you have to operate, you know, within certain sort of constraints right. of how right. you think about and how you present the evidence and how you build an argument. Um, and that's, that sounds really boring, but at it, it's my challenge. It's your job. It's my job, right. but it, in turn, it's my job to challenge, you know, creatives to find a way so that it's, it, but we're not being questioned, um, that they trust not only the people that are on screen, but they trust in the film and they maintain their trust in us as, you know, as a, as a media platform. Um, so I, that's what I'm thinking about as I'm listening to this right. discussion mm -hmm. as something that I think unifies everything that these filmmakers I, either have dealt with or are currently dealing with. Um, and, you know, my job. I can't thank you enough for say, saying that because it, it uh, I don't know if you guys remember the term from the civil rights movement of the 60s, is don't muddy the message, right, is, is one way don't of looking. What? Don't muddy the message, right? That, that's a fail of what I was talking about before of which is more important, telling the nuanced truth or telling, getting your message across. And thank you for if you don't have that data, and I'm gonna out a film really quickly, but with our film, there's a film called GMO OMG, and that can, I can show you the data that that was propaganda in the end, and they didn't vet it that you're saying, so thank you for doing that. So I think it uh, underlined the issue that it's, you can have a great story, great passion, great characters, and from your point of view, you also need really sound science. Because it, it does need, especially with any controversial topics, if it's not bulletproof, you can be shot down, in other words. And we've seen this many cases where the, the filmmaking is a, co there's complicated issues and there's a little, th they, they do some oversimplification, yeah. and then they're attacked by various critics or industry or even individuals for, for not being accurate. Well, I, I'm gonna jump in because I think the part of what we can do is help the people who are here understand how they can, if, if they are interested in working in any of these areas, if they're thinking, interested in bringing ideas to discovery. You know, our job is to work with the filmmaker, whether they are pitching an idea, whether they're bringing us something that we decide we want to develop. That development process, for me, one of the most important you know, aspects of that development process is finding out whether the evidence base is there that gives us the confidence that, this, that the film can be made. I, once we've done that, and we know how to do that, my colleagues are, are very good at, you know, at, at helping filmmakers you know, establish that, that foundation and, 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 and finding, helping them to find that evidence base. Right. Then the challenge is, going forward, that how does the film creatively handle that? I, I'm not worried about in, uh, in the filmmaking, uh, I'm not worried that we're going to ulti not ultimately get there. I wouldn't have funded the film right. if I didn't know that the evidence was there. And then it becomes a creative process from that point to completion. Um, and, then it's, and then it's how do you even then handle that when you're taking it out into the world and dealing with the press and how does the right. press understand their role in writing about or right. talking about right. the right. film and how do we help them understand what the evidence base is that the film used. Right, so actually that, that leads us into, um, oh, is there any time for Q&A or a few minutes? Okay, it's a couple more minutes. I mean, we didn't talk that much about impact yet and the three of you, three of you have new films coming out in the next year or two. And so what's your hope for the impact? What do you want to see with your film? How it impacts the world? What kind of conversations might get started or changes or whatever? David, do you want to jump in a little? Uh, from my point of view, I think the ultimate takeaway for our film is the need and appreciation for sustainable fishing mm -hmm. and finding ways 
that uh, fishermen can continue to do what they've done for generations, mm -hmm. and we clearly uh, have a desire to eat seafood and ground fish and things like cod, uh, but to find a way to uh, to do that in 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 ways that are not going to destroy the ecosystem, that are not mm -hmm. going to disturb the seabed uh, to the point that a complete uh, fishery, which which uh, centuries ago was so huge that uh, that they used to say you could literally walk across the Atlantic on the backs of cod, mm -hmm. uh, to the point that now um, in vast portions of the Gulf of Maine, which spans mm -hmm. from Nova Scotia to Cape Cod, there are no cod. Um, and o overfishing is a worldwide issue. It's not, it's throughout the Mediterranean. Right, and, all and, the and ultimately I see this film as a, you know, a, a, in some ways is just a sense of, it's a, it's, it's a focused understanding of one fishery, and this is a problem worldwide, right, obviously. Right, right. Christy? Uh, so, so we're still making the film, so my answer might not be as uh, a little early, but <laughs> um, uh, well articulated. But I think that as as we went into making the film and as we make the film, I'd say there's two things. One is that we can return the New York Harbor and other harbors that were once filled with oysters to that state. That that's doable. That's possible. That should happen. Um, and I think also the the incredible value of children um, and engaging them young, right. um, right. when they're young, um, in um, environmental issues where they are actively doing things. You know, not just. Not just recycling. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's not like You're a class trip. You're gonna have an trip. app for this too though, right? Just kidding. And an app, of course. <laughs> But I think, so I think just sort of seeing I in a way, you know, a celebration of these assets that yeah. we have, which are harbors that can be filled with oysters, that can filter the water, that can protect us from storms um, that are all, all the more frequent and all the more violent, um, and also that we can um, create wonderful opportunities for, for our youth to, right. to be right. the, the solution. Wonderful. Scott. Yeah, I said this a little bit before, so I'll try, I'll try and keep it short, but it is a, uh, as much as this is a reset of the GMO controversy, um, and we really hope that it will uh, reset, reset the conversation on GMOs to say that it w is this, this is a technology that we can use. Um, I hope that it's also gonna be a reset on the way that we look at science and look at data and even look at activism. One of the most effective articles that we have at the end of the film, we hope some people in the audience saw this too, was when a, a, over 100 Nobel laureates came forward right. and asked Greenpeace to stop lying about the dangers of GMOs. Mm -hmm. And that's a shocking thing to see. And they didn't say, Greenpeace, close your doors, mm -hmm. but they did say, just because we have loved you in the past, that doesn't mean we're gonna go lockstep behind you with any decision that you make. So, so you really want this to be a centerpiece of a, ne of a much bigger discussion, a national conversation. Absolutely. It's going to be international. Check your, check your biases, yes. check your biases, and uh, make good decisions. Yes. Do we well, know how we can see your film um, in the future if we didn't see it? This was just our world premiere, so we are, we don't know where it's going to go so next. So looking for distribution or broadcast, so. Okay, any questions from the audience? Raise your hand and stand up and speak up loudly because there's no microphone. Thank you for the wonderful thoughts that you shared with us. I also made some uh, environmental um, films, and uh, my approach to the whole thing was that uh, I'd like not only to inform, but also transform, you know, make some change, just, just like you do. But my challenge was always the structure. What works best is the <coughs> hero's journey kind of thing, but that doesn't always apply to environmental films. So I'm just wondering if you could give us some advice how to structure an environmental film <laughs> that, that you know, you want to uh, give out a lot of information in such a way that the people who watch it would be emotionally touched and uh, enticed to do, do something about it. To okay, did everybody hear the question? How, how do you structure an environmental film? So well, I, I would just say that the first thing that you want to be careful about, and, I'm, and I think I see it in, in the other films here, 
is to avoid being didactic. You, you know, if you try to make a film, and I think you often see this with environmental films, that it comes across as overly morally instructive. Uh, I think you lose your or audience. Or self-righteous. Self-righteous, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it has to be, you, you have to, it has to be a film. It has to have life and real moments and hopefully verite and real people and people you believe in that are authentic, um, regardless of whether you agree with their point of view or not. It's so hard. I mean, I, I remember seeing a stop motion film being introduced at a film festival and the filmmaker said making a stop motion film is like uh, making love and being stabbed to death at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, always compared that to the editing process on a documentary. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there, it, your question is incredibly complex and it clearly it starts from subject matter, casting, the way you shoot it. You know, so many amazing decisions. And then when you get when you get stuck, I mean, clearly reaching out to to other filmmakers and people that can advise you on saying, I I'm I, I'm not going to get stuck in saying I'm going to make the hero's journey. I'm going to I'm going to shove this square peg into the round hole of the hero's journey. Say, whoa, what is the footage telling me? What is the yeah. best way to tell this story based on this footage? I, I'd also say one thing is that so some filmmakers want to put everything in their film, tell you everything they possibly <laughs> can. You know, I had one filmmaker come to me and said we. We did 70 different expert interviews for our film. We're putting all of them in, and we're putting them in twice each. And I thought, shoot me, just sh I don't. This is you know, and it was a painful experience to watch the movie. So you really need to be, you know exactly what you want to say and to be focused is extremely important. Um, I'd add one thing. I, first of all, like, I wish there was an answer in general <laughs> to that. Um, but uh, you know, th that structuring a film, uh, be it an environmental film or any film, uh, nonfiction film, is always is always a great challenge. Um, one sort of tip I would say is that something s really valuable you, you you referenced, you know, talking to other filmmakers. But you know, is is when you have a cut and and you're not you, you it might be packed with information, but you don't realize it. It might be all heart and soul and no information to share that cut. You know, in a feedback screening um, with with some you know regular p people, non environmentalists, non filmmakers, people whose opinions you just trust. Um, that's a really um, critically important moment in, I think, the, um, the that most successful films have done that and have done that at the right moment and it can be really valuable. So, you, you, and you can get answers from that from, from absolutely inexperienced filmmakers who have really great, can give you really great feedback um, to, to help strengthen your, your film. John, do you have anything you want to add? For you work with so many filmmakers over the years, and um, something that I um, I think that we all yearn for is in anything that we do, and not every film um, can be structured this way, but that that does have a story arc, um, and what I an, an arc or an arch, and I use this analogy a lot in 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 my talks with filmmakers, with my team, in my own brain. You know, an arch is in a remarkably strong structure. You know, mm -hmm. um, and if it's if it is well constructed as an arch, you can hang many things off it. Meaning that you can have digressions. You can leave that primary story to go in depth into smaller things and and have a lot of you know um, science. Um, but if you don't have that strong arch. Um, y you know the, the the film will lose its way, so that's 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 a, that's, great, that's that's what a I great way to look at it. That's, so. that's great. Yeah. Any we have time for what? One more question? Two more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, everyone. My name is Sasha. Uh, I appreciate this panel, and uh, all movies look super excited to me. And to me, as a filmmaker, I want to ask you guys uh, about uh, internationally, like making. Uh, uh, documentaries internationally going abroad, in particular about the food devolution, which is interested me the most. The what relation, sorry? Uh, international. Yeah. 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 So uh, Russia recently forbid the uh, import and growing GMO at all. Yeah. So my question is, uh, like, have you 
gone abroad and what is your experience as a documentary movie making or going abroad sure. uh, international like what is the difficulties and you know how do you solve it okay so the question is about international broadcast yeah. distribution and what are the challenges maybe john do you want to I think it's the filmmakers' perspective oh, okay. because yeah. you know I I have this you know very I, corporate I sort of experience I, I with international um, as opposed you know, to being I a filmmaker. Global who brands. I'm a global brand <laughs> um, <laughs> who you know experience. these guys and their struggle to get their films uh, out internationally <laughs> without something <laughs> like Discovery. Any also any your films go international? Scott? Yeah, no, the the Garden. Out out garden. Uh, okay, very okay, high. Um, but to your first to your point about Russia banning import of of GMOs. And growing, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a real shame that they're 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 doing that based on on fear, and they're probably not getting the science. Uh, Anne Glover was the head of the EU science advisor, and she basically got fired because of some activists saying she's not going lockstep with our our fears of, of GMOs, and she said the science doesn't support that. So obviously, we would be incredibly honored if the it, and we're going to be pushing for the film to be seen by as many people as possible to change things like that. Um, how you do that, how you get your film seen, obviously there's, you wanna have sales agents and distributors that are gonna help you uh, make that happen. Obviously we're in a different time where we can also do that on our own, through our own websites, and people can find the film uh, through, through the internet. But I, we hope that we will use you know, all, all aspects to do that. USC has an amazing uh, program. I'm going to forget the name, but it's the Documentary Showcase, where they choose films to take all around the world through through the uh, consulates and and share these films. So there's a lot of ways to get it out there. Christy, was was place at the table? Was that did that go global or was that more just in America? And share these films. So there's a lot of ways. Um, a place at the table was. Julie, are you here still? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did have global global distribution. Right. Uh -huh. Not not a lot of t broadcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it did have global global distribution. Not, not a lot of broadcast. Right. So, so yeah, that depends. Some films are very U.S. centric. But interestingly, yeah. so a place at the table was a film about hunger in America. Right. Solitary is a film about a supermax prison, right. also in America, and the interest, the international interest in solitary, is is great. In fact, we had a German, so we, we presented the film at um, IDFA, um, the International Documentary Festival of Amsterdam, um, which takes place now. Um, uh, and uh, we pitched there to a group of international um, commissioners and broadcasters, and there was great interest, and we mm. um, secured German um, co-producing, co financing, and partnerships, and France. And uh, so, so I think it depends on the film, it depends on the subject, it depends on the interest, but I think trying to get out there into the world um, and, and meeting um, uh, co-producers and commissioners from around the world if you have a film that you want to be seen around the world is valuable. In this case, we're really fortunate because we have a giant global brand who's gonna get it out, yeah. And David, your previous films, were they? Did they so, uh, so my experience with my last film, uh, which was called Undaunted, uh, and was about the first uh, little person who uh, ran the Boston Marathon and how her oh. journey mm -hmm. to the finish line was, was stopped a mile before, uh, and then she came back the next year and then finally finished the race, and mm -hmm. I actually ran with her and carried a friggin' camera the whole awesome entire way, title. which wow. was... The, one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, <laughs> um, uh, and had and she's really fast, so I had a hard time keeping up with her. And she's three foot nine. Um, um, but uh, but we were fortunate. It was broadcast by the BBC World News, and it was allegedly screened in I think uh, almost or not screened, but broadcast in almost every country with the exception of North Korea and. For some reason, the UK. The whole which film. Does not the whole film or clips from the film. No, the whole film. The whole wow, film. incredible! So Great. Uh, so I haven't had to, uh, thankfully, with Sacred Cod, which will be broadcast internationally next spring, haven't had to go through the distributor mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. route. But our film premiered uh, in September at the Camden International Film right, Festival, right, right. and the route that seems 
like a lot of filmmakers will take is you get lucky enough to screen your film at a at a film festival like this or earn it. You don't get lucky. <laughs> thank you. Um, and um, and you know distributors see it or learn about it and approach me, and that's happened with us uh, since our film premiered. So, and so, so f your underlying film festivals can be very important in reaching out a foreign, big audience. That's, uh, that's my limited experience okay. as of now. Right. Okay, what, what, one last question for me. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Um, well, I, you know, I've been at Discovery for two years now. Um, I came from HBO, so controversy and HBO go hand in hand. They welcome controversy because it plays to their advantage of being a, you know, a, a premium cable, non-ad supported environment. So that's easy to understand how HBO um, fits in. Um, so coming to an ad supported environment um, where I had never worked um, was a learning you know, curve for me. I had to come to understand not just a new company um, and a brand, but I had to understand a whole new sort of corporate environment. Um, and so this was, I mean, your question gets to the heart of, you know, one of the, the biggest um, questions I had um, about what my experience would be like um, and how, you know, um, my colleagues would, uh, how, how open they would be to controversial material. So um, the best way I can answer your question is to talk about a film called Hunt Watch, which we put on in September. This is a film made with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, which is the 40-year-old um, uh, advocacy group that has been trying to stop the slaughter of baby seals in off of the coast of Newfoundland. Um, and so we, uh, came into that film at a sort of similar place um, in its evolution as Sacred Cod, where the film was very far along but not finished. And we helped finish the film. Um, the film has had a festival life uh, in, its in, in one form, and then it's been um, recut for television. And the reason it was recut um, is that it is a stunningly graphic and horrific um, sort of uh, examination of this practice of the clubbing of what is currently, what at its peak was 450,000 white baby seals um, that is now at 200,000. And I, we wanted to put this film on because I thought that that was over. I didn't think that we were doing that anymore, but we are. Um, and so we, that's when you see Hunt Watch, you can't unsee it. Um, and so that was the reaction of my colleagues that when they all, when I asked them to look at it, that was sort of the response. You, now that you know this film was made and now you, that you know this practice continues and we have a global platform, we have to. It's, it's our moral imperative if we believe that certain species or all species should be protected from extinction, this is a practice that can't be allowed to continue and we have to do whatever we can to stop it. So I am incredibly proud that I work for a company that um, felt that this film, that what advertiser is going to put their product next to a dead baby seal? I mean, it's a cliche. Um, but we put it on without advertising. So. So I think we, we need to wrap up. I want to thank all our panelists today. We just barely scratched the surface, but I think we touched on some important issues. And um, thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Doc NYC. Thank, thank you, Josh, you. David, Scott, Christy, John. Thank you.